This is an interview with Jimi Hendrix. It was done in London about two weeks after his second album was released. I'm going to make some comments about my impressions of Hendrix and point out some things to look for when you listen to this interview. It's a good interview. When I met Jimi Hendrix, my first impression was his presence was so strong. It was sort of like stepping into a field of electricity. And I don't know if it's because of the giant amps that he was working with or just being a superstar and having all that energy directed at you, you know. But I wish there had been a way that this tape could have captured some of that vibrancy that I felt at that moment. I did this interview mainly because I wanted to meet him, and I honestly did not have one question ready. I figured that, you know, when the time came, I'd open my mouth and sort of a question would come out. We've all heard interviews where the interviewer is so involved lining up the next question that he or she doesn't hear what the person's trying to say. Well, I didn't have a next question. I just listened to what he was saying. And what he was saying led to the next question. And he was so sensitive, as you'll hear, he could see me listening, and he really opened up. You really hate these interviews. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, what's well, all right, you know. <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, you do have a lot, you know. Pardon? A lot of people bothering you about interviews. Well, like, yeah, to tell the truth, yeah, there is a lot, you know, but um, it's all right, though, you know, like, sometimes you just feel like talking, sometimes you don't, though, you know. Yeah. Just going in different moods. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so some of the usual... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. That's all right. No, it doesn't bother me at all. I just want to get this light for a second. Yeah. You're originally from Buffalo, and you've been here about... No, it. not from no? Buffalo. No, no I'm from Seattle, Washington. Originally, wow. but I used to live. I lived all over the states, though, yeah. and then I wound up in New York, you know, not too long ago. Yeah. But I lived all over the states. I stayed in Buffalo for about a month or two, and it was too cold up there. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, yeah but if you were in Seattle, you know, it can't be any co colder in Buffalo. No, but Seattle has a different type of cold, though. You know, it's a different. It's a nice coldness, you know. Yeah. It isn't so uh, cutting as Buffalo. Anyway, there's this girl up there trying to work roots on me, work this brutal stuff, keep me there, you know. <laughs> I had to go to the hospital and all that, so, but I could make that scene. Uh, what do you mean you had to go to the hospital? Well, like, you know, she tried working roots. You know, that's, that's a scene like a, they might put a, you know, there's different things they can do. They can put something in your food or either put some uh, hair in your shoe, you know, some of the hair in your shoe. Uh, no, I'm not Voodoo uh, stuff, yeah. Mojo. Yeah, and all that kind of stuff, yeah. Right, yeah. Well, she tried that, and uh, I don't know. She must have tried it half-heartedly, because I was just only sick in the hospital for about two or three days. Do you ever get involved in, the, in that scene, other than... Not anymore. Really, you know, like, around in the southern United States, you know, they have a lot of scenes like that going on. Yeah. But, um, just, you know, if I, if I see it happen, or if I feel it happen, then I believe it. Yeah. You know, I mean, not necessarily if I just hear it being talked about. What about charms and things like this, you know? Oh, yeah. If a person, you know, a person gives off, they give off certain, many, you know, Electric shocks, anyway, yeah, really. Yeah, energies. And yeah, yeah, and so then if they can, uh, they can actually get these things together, really, you know, if the vibrations are strong enough to get these charms working, you know, they can actually do it. I was watching you when you were talking mm. to the uh, this girl that came in. I think she sent you some clothes for you. Oh yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, that was very nice because you were really what you were really watching her and you were really <laughs> taking her in. I mean, take her in, and, and I mean just like sizing up. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. she seemed like a nice girl. I like to take her home and. You know, scrub her up a little bit, and then, you know, go into the scene. And then get the clothes measured up, maybe. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, she's supposed to come out there for that. Name. I don't know. <laughs> but see, I don't go back, you know, like some girls, you don't go by appearance. Mm. You go by different, there's other things that girls have to offer besides their looks, you know. Mm. That makes you may, might want to be with them, you know, yeah. for a second or two. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, there's, there's other things, you know, besides that. Yeah. I don't just go by this look, you know, because. Boy, we know the story, you know, some of them, this one, some of the worst people in the world. But, uh, you know, you go by other things, I don't know what it is, you can just feel little things. You say, damn, I might want to be with her, I don't know. Let me check myself there, see what happens. It's great. You know, what about this, I mean, I mentioned, you know, but needless to say, a lot of people are envious, me included, you know. Um, <laughs> not necessarily, really. Yeah. Well, you should, because, you know, if, it, if you're not used to it, well, it could kill you, really. <laughs> 
Really, but it's just, a, it's just another way of uh, um, communication. That's why other people can't understand and say, well, damn, why are you with so many people? You know, I said, well, I don't necessarily be, you know, touching those people all the time. I just be talking to them. Some I talk to, and then others, you know, well, you know, <laughs> they're for, and uh, they're after. <laughs> this is a scene like, uh, it's, if it's part of you, you know, this is nature. I don't know. I just can't help it. That's all. <laughs> it's just, no, it's a scene like, uh, um, that's another way of communication, though. You have your own ways, you know. Some people just can communicate better by, you know, not even, by not even knowing each other's name, by saying, Hey, hi, how are you doing there? Uh, would you come with me there for a minute? And then, you know, it's all, you know, and you do that. And you can be the best of friends then. Yeah. Some even get married after that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have to you find it, it just sort of flow with it when you, you start to get this, you know, this image, which, you know, as you... As you oh, it was worse before, because I, I used to be on the block starving, you know, and girls used to help me and all that, you know. Girls are some of my best friends, because they used to help me, you know, and really help me, too. Yeah. And uh, I really, and ever since then, that's why I say to myself, well, any girl I meet now, I want to try to show my appreciation for what they did for me before. No, serious, though, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I don't know, it's just nature. In this section, we talk about his second album. Now, he was really unhappy about it. This section is an interesting document, I guess you could call it, of the kinds of frustrations that Hendrix went through. That is, the artist, Jimi Hendrix, talking about what he's trying to do, create, and how he's being frustrated by those that were managing him at that time what they wanted him to do and to be. I hope you'll listen closely to this part because there's something really bizarre happening between Hendrix and myself. Hendrix was so unhappy about the new album that had just come out, he's trying to express his frustrations to me. You'll hear him sort of sputtering out of sheer frustration. But I felt at that time that what he was saying was so personal so revealing that it shouldn't be on tape. He had obviously been hurt. And so what he was trying to tell me was really private stuff, not for the public. And at that time, you know, I didn't have the sense to turn off the tape machine and set the mic down and say, okay, let's talk about it. Instead, what you hear is Hendrix trying to tell me about these frustrations of his, and I'm trying to get him not to tell me. You know, my questions are trying to steer him away from it. But everything he talks about brings him right back to it again. Listen to the sound of his voice. He was incredibly open about himself. I really don't care what our records as far as chart-wise. We had this one that only made number 11, you know. His name, The Burning of the Midnight Lap, which everybody around here hated. They said that was the worst record, you know. But to me, that was the best one we ever made. Not far as recording, because the recording technique was really bad. You know, you couldn't hear the words so good. Probably that's what it was. Yeah, how, are you satisfied with the recording technique no, generally? No, not at no. all. No. What about on the LPs? Same thing. Not at all. Worse even on the LPs. It makes me so yeah. mad. Because, see, that's part of us. Yeah. And, like, see, like, we recorded and everything, and then all of a sudden, Something happens and it just comes out all screwed up. You just get so mad, you just don't want to know about it anymore. Like our next up here, this, it, every track is going to have to be right or else I'm just, you know, just going to forget about it. I mean, well, not forget about it. That's the way I, you know, you yeah. say that, you know, right, but you're not. Yeah, yeah. But that's the way I feel. Do you think they're better in the States as far as recording? Or it uh, really depends upon the engineer? That, uh, well, like, it all depends on what you want, really, all depends on where you go to. It really depends on so many things, the cutting of it, excuse me, the, the cutting of it depends on the whole, that's the whole scene. You can get in there and mix and mix and mix and get such a beautiful sound, and when it's time to cut it, they could just screw it up so bad. Jesus, I don't understand. I know. I, I, I wouldn't understand that either, because we, you know, ooh, it comes out all bad, because they go by levels and all that. Some people don't have imagination. See, when you cut a record, right before it's being printed, Excuse me, you know, when you cut the master, that, uh, excuse me, if you want a sound where you can, really deep sound, you know, where you have depth and all this, you must almost remix it again right there, the cutting place. And 99% don't even do this. They just go and say, oh yeah, turn it up there, make sure that it doesn't go over there, make sure it doesn't go under, you know. And there it is, it's nothing but one dimensional. Yeah. Do you get the time that you need, I mean, in, 
you know, because it's so, cost, no, we, so we, costly anyway. We did our, in these oh, well, studios and the that's money doesn't not, make that's a difference to me. Up, yeah, because yeah, that's what I make the money for is to make better things, yeah. you know, happen. Yeah. That's, I don't have no value in money at all. That's the only, my only fault. Cause I just get the things that I see and want and or you to try to put it into music. I, w I want to have a stereo where it goes up, the sound goes up and behind and underneath, you know. But all you can get now is just across and across. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A new EP was made in 16 days, which I'm very sad about, you know. The one that's just dropped yeah. recently, yeah. Really? But no use even talk about, you know, discussing why, because mm. it really is a bad scene. But it uh, just makes me mad, though. It could have been so much better. It's mainly the sound quality. And, and N well, the songs could have been better, too. You know, that's what yeah. I think, though. As soon as you finish, then you want to, you, you got a completely new ideas. You know? Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, it's good. I mean, in a sense, because your mind's moving mm -hmm. along, you know, purring along nicely. Yeah. yeah, it's not necessarily getting any better, but, like, you might move to different things, you know. Do you feel the groups are free to uh, change as they want to? No, yeah. half of them aren't. They're all yeah. thinking about their career and thinking about their future so much. I don't really don't give a damn about my future or career. I just want to make sure I can get out what I want, you know. Yeah. You know, that's why I say we're, we're very lucky. Because we didn't have, you know, all of us didn't have that, you know, so, well, you know, it would be great if we did you know, make it nice. Yeah. But I really wouldn't care as long as we could be happy with what we're doing, like recording and stuff like that, or do what we want to do. We're still, you know, we're not really doing what we want. But that's, you know, yeah. completely yeah. What, what about the uh, new LP? Have you been thinking about this? Then? Yeah. Well, I wanted to make it a double LP, you know, which would be yeah. almost impossible. And have about... F because of the cost, you mean? Well, yeah, it's a big hassle. You know, nobody doesn't want to do that. The record producers mm. and the companies don't want to do that. I'm willing to spend every single penny on it if if I thought it was good enough. But uh, there you go, you know. I do that, and then they leave, leave me out there. What about the length of the songs, too? I mean, would well, you like yeah, them to be much longer? It depends on how, what kind of song it is. If it's a song with about three or four movements, well, yeah. Like, like this one, this one song I wrote named... Um, Eyes and imagination, that's the name of it. Mm. And it's about 14 minutes long. But it's about, it's telling about every sentence or every two sentences tell a completely different story. Mm. It's nothing but imagination. It starts off with this baby crying, you know, a brand new baby has been born. And then you hear these bullets, you know, <laughs> in the background. You know, it's, it's nothing but this imagination. <clears throat> and it's a, every sentence tells a different story. And it's about, but it goes in about four major movements. But I always go back to this one little thing. You must have that one little thing through it, you know. That one little. But I don't even know. If there's so many songs I wrote that, that we haven't even done yet that we'll probably never do. It's because, uh, yeah, ooh, it's, it's, there's a lot of things around here that's really bad. So yeah, yeah, it's it's okay. Yeah. You know, we must be Elvis Presley's and rock and rolls yeah. and drugs. We must be that. <laughs> yeah, that's where it's not, isn't it? And there'll be no smoking in the gas chamber. Mm. <laughs> I don't see. Wow. Um, do, do you think people will be doing longer numbers if you're trying to? Um, well, like if they have like something moving towards maybe even symphonies. Yeah, know? I think they should if they have something to offer. Really, if this number really, if the number really has to be long, they said, "Well, I got this number, but I just can't get it together unless it's, I just need more time on it." Well, then they should, really should. They should never hold, you know, um, time like that because of a number. You know the song that we had named Purple Haze? Yeah. That was about, um, it had about a thousand, thousand words. <laughs> and it did, and then, ooh, oh, I just got myself mad, because that isn't even a Purple Haze, you know? Well, what do you mean? That is, that's I don't know, man. I miss a frustrated old hen, that's what, that's what I feel like. <sighs> but that was, you should have heard it, man. I had it written out. It's about going through all these, uh, this land, you know, this mythical, because that's what I had to do, is write a lot of mythical scenes. You know, like the, the history of the wars on Neptune and all yeah. this mess, you know. And the reason why the ring, rings are there, you know. You have, you have all these... See, like, how they got the Greek gods and all that mythology? Well, you can have your own mythology scene. Or write, you know, fiction. Mm -hmm. Complete fiction, though, you know. I mean, anybody could say, well, I was walking down the street, and I see an elephant floating through the sky. Well, it has no meaning at all, you know. There's nothing imagined except this is an elephant there, you know. And if you don't watch out, you might break your neck. <laughs> you think you'll be able to make more demands as you continue? Yeah, this, yeah. this whole thing's going to blow wide open soon. <laughs>
This is probably my favorite part. I'm not sure how we got into talking about this. The original interview was lost, except for these sections you're now hearing. And fortunately, these are the best sections. Anyway, at this point, Hendrix is so animated, he gets up and starts pacing about the room. And I should mention, this was done with a single handheld microphone. There's a certain advantage to this. Uh, you have to sit alongside the person so you can swing the mic back and forth, you know, from your questions to their answers. And it's sort of rubbing shoulders with a person and it enables you to touch the person. And I don't mean necessarily physically touching, you know, their arm or their hand or something. But, um, I mean, mentally touch the person, sort of sync your mind with their mental state. And you have to feel the person, and they need to feel you, see, you know, you're okay. And it establishes a trust. And as I've said, Hendrix's presence was so strong, and the energy in the room was so hot at this point, that I was high for a week after doing this interview. One last thought. I realized that if I approached Hendrix as the pop star, he would have been forced to reply as the pop star. And that's what this interview would have been, the pop star talking about his records. But I wanted to talk with Hendrix the person, you know, the artist, and he replied as that, and that's what we get in this section. I think it's a rare and uh, kind of a beautiful view of Hendrix as he talks about his childhood memories and his dreams. Can you remember when he was a little baby? I think you just come, your memory to comes through. The, no, to yeah. about the age of two and a half. Yeah. yeah. But it came back like a yeah. dream. Yeah. yeah, there you go. When you think about it now, it's just blank before that, then you think of that. Well, I think that's why you come about on some other scenes too, you know. Because human beings die too easily, you know. But, you know, it's the first thing. What about, what about the animal? You said the like animal. A, like, like you might see an animal or something like that. And also you might have a very right. funny feeling go through you for a second. Do you, like, do you mean like looking into his eyes or like, or yeah, not necessarily, or like, just the animal itself? Yeah, one time I seen this deer, you know. And because I, I see a lot of deers around where I, you know, where I used to be from. And I said, I said, wait. If something went through me for once, like I'd seen him before. I mean, like, I had some real close connections with that deer for one split second, and then it just went away like that, you know. That happens, you know, like a lot of friends of mine tell me about that. That happened to him, you know. Have you ever laid in bed and uh, you was in this complete state where you couldn't move or couldn't or nothing like that, but, you know, you're like that, and you get you feel like you're going deep and deep into something, not sleep, but it's something else. Yeah. Exactly. And every time I go into that, then I say, oh, hell, I'm scared as hell. You know, you get all scared and stuff. So you try to say, help, help. You can't move. You can't scream. You say, help, help. You finally get out of it, you know, because <laughs> you just can't move. It's a very funny feeling. But one time I was going to try it. One time I, that feeling was coming through me. You know, I said, oh, here we go. This time I'm going to see if I can. I'm just going to let it happen and see where I go to or see what happens, you know. So I was really getting really scary, man. I was going like that, you know. I said, I'm not even asleep, you know. So this is really strange. And somebody knocked on the door, you know. I said, oh, because I wanted to find out. Well, can you remember something that's really far back when you when you when yeah, you I can remember when the nurse put the dice. I remember. When can you really? Yeah, when the nurse. I, I don't know what I was there for, but I remember when I used to wear diapers. Yeah. And then uh, she was like talking to me. She took me out of the uh, this crib or something like that. And then she held me up to the window. This was in Seattle, mm -hmm. and she was showing me um, something up against the sky. And it was fireworks and all that. It must have been the Fourth of July, you know, because and I remember and I remember her putting the diaper on me and almost sticking it, you know, I was, I was asleep, you know, and then she put like that. I remember I didn't feel so good, you know. I must have, I must have been in the hospital sick about something, and I had a bottle and all that kind of stuff. And then she held me up to the window. She, you know, she's saying something about it. You know. And I was looking in, in the sky. It was this almost an acid thing. Oh, wow, that's right. That's what it was because yeah. only beforehand, <laughs> <laughs> my first trip there. <laughs> And nurse turns me off. <laughs> Being high off the penicillin, she probably gave me. So. Can you remember any others? Well, I was small enough to fit in the clothes basket. I remember when I was small enough to fit in the clothes basket. You know the straw clothes baskets they have in America? Yeah. yeah. You put all the dirty clothes in. And there's, there's only about like that. There's ha they call them hampers or something? Yeah, hampers. Yeah. I remember when my cousin and I was in there playing around. Oh, yeah. But that must have been when I was about three or something like that. And like sometimes when you're sitting around, then you start remembering some of the things that happened beforehand. Those are the first two that comes to my mind. And some dreams that I had when I was real little, you know. Like my mother was being carried away on this camel. And it was a big uh, caravan. She's saying, well, I'm going to see you now. And she's going under these trees. And you can see the shade, you know, the leaf patterns across her face. But she's going under this, you know, like that. 
and the sun, you know how the sun shines through a tree, and if you go under the shadows of the tree, the sh shadows go across your face. Well, these were in green and yellow shadows. Like, she's saying, well, uh, I won't be seeing you too much anymore, you know, so I'll see. And then about two years after that, she died, you know. And I said, yeah, but where are you going? Or like that, you know. I remember that. I always really remember that one. I never did forget. There's some dreams you never forget. Yeah. Like one time I went, this is one dream, you go down like that, this real big hill, but it has real long grass, and then there's a whole lot of bananas down the floor, uh, at the floor of this hill, but yeah. they're all spread all over, and they're growing from the ground by each one separate. And um, I remember that, and then we were skating across that. I don't know how we were, but what you do is lay, you pour this stuff out that we made up. You know, it's big bags, you pour it out across the bananas, and it fills up all the gaps, and then you skate across it. it was, you know, I remember those things, you know. You must have been dreaming in color when you were very oh, young. Oh, exactly. I, I, always, I don't remember too many. The, the closest to a black and white dream I ever had was in, in pastel shades, you know? Yeah, yeah. One time I was in pastel shades, like a, it was maroon and uh, dark, you know, and then light, very light maroon. And then this big gold cliff out of the middle of nowhere. It was great. And that was the closest I ever got to black and white. This final section is only a few words about reincarnation and death. People really, be, you know, people really believe that that every single person is born here is completely different. You know, I mean that's that's true. But through the times, can you imagine all these? Like, what if we all are supposed to go to heaven? All that? Can you imagine all these people who died beforehand, and all of us, all of in heaven, yeah, all of on top of each other? Hey man, move over, man. I don't have the rule up here. It's a hill. You had no business dying, did you? So, oh God. <laughs> so can you imagine that? Wow. This has been an interview with Jimi Hendrix. Your guide has been Meatball Fulton.